Hello, my name is Phil Armstrong. I'm a research scientist here at the Connecticut Agricultural Experiment Station. I'm also the director of the statewide mosquito surveillance program, which is the subject for today's talk. So mosquito-borne uh, diseases is an, are an annual threat here in Connecticut. Uh, the two major viral diseases of concern are Eastern Equine Encephalitis Virus and West Nile Virus. Both can cause a life-threatening illness in people. Uh, and uh, with both of these infections, there are no uh, vaccines for use in people or effective antiviral treatments available. Uh, there is, I should say, a vaccine available for horses, uh, but nothing um, for people. So really, uh, uh, in order to uh, protect the public, uh, we rely uh, primarily on a, on a surveillance program that allows early detection of the virus and gives us good information to assess risk and inform the public and guide uh, disease control measures. And our long-term goal uh, is to really prevent sustained disease outbreaks. We cannot prevent uh, isolated uh, human cases, but um, we are in a position to make an have an impact on uh, disease outbreaks. Um, so the way it works, uh, mosquitoes are trapped at locations throughout the state from June to October. We have 108 uh, permanent trapping stations. 16, 16 of these are new sites that were added in 2020 to increase trap coverage in uh, areas in eastern Connecticut uh, that are uh, high-risk areas for triple E virus. Each trap is set every 10 days, and if we detect West Nile virus or triple E virus from mosquitoes, we then go to those sites and increase our trapping frequency to twice weekly. Two to three different traps are uh, used at each location. And uh, really this information gives us detailed information about the risk and allows us to detect virus in advance of human and animal cases. So this just shows a map of the location of all the trapping sites throughout the state. Um, you'll see the sites in green are those 16 new sites that were added in 2020 um, in eastern Connecticut. And again, these are ad these are monitored every, uh, traps are set every 10 days overnight. And, um, and all the mosquitoes that we trap are identified and tested for viral infection. Uh, so this just sort of want to talk a little bit about the different kinds of traps we use. Uh, this is the CDC light trap. It's a trap that we hang up on trees and uh, run overnight to collect host-seeking female mosquitoes that are out for a blood meal. Uh, and this trap collects a large diversity of different mosquito species that are seeking blood. And really the way it works is up on top you'll see the blue cooler. We put chunks of dry ice which omit a plume of carbon dioxide. So mosquitoes when they're looking for a blood meal they're attracted to carbon dioxide. Uh, we all exhale carbon dioxide as we breathe and so it's a major uh, uh, attractant for mosquitoes and allows them to find their hosts. So um, uh, we also, um, each of these traps has a light source uh, in the middle there that um, also attracts mosquitoes uh, and a fan that uh, will suck the mosquitoes into the trap and into the collection net below. So that's the CDC light trap and that's what the trap collection looks like on a bad day. The other trap we use is called the CDC Gravid Trap. So this is a little different. Um, we're attracting mosquitoes that have already had a blood meal and are looking to lay eggs. And so you'll see there's this blue uh, reservoir on the bottom that's filled with water. It's a hay, yeast, lactalbumin infusion water that is high organic content and is a very attractive to certain mosquito species that are looking to lay their eggs, primarily Culex pipians and Culex restuans. These are the major vectors 
or carriers of West Nile virus. And so this is a very efficient trap to monitor for uh, West Nile virus uh, risk in those locations. And the way it works is there's the uh, reservoir, and the mosquitoes then get sucked up into that central column into the uh, collection net above. Uh, finally, we have a third trap that are used in certain locations that are uh, have the appropriate habitat for the mosquito species called Aedes albopictus. This is the Asian tiger mosquito that is an invasive species brought into the U.S. in the 1980s and is moving northward into our region in the northeast. Connecticut is the northern limit of its range. And um, so we're monitoring for this species. It's a, an aggressive human biter and also a vector of a number of viruses like Zika virus, chikungunya virus, and dengue virus in, in certain parts of the world. So uh, we are also uh, monitoring for this species as well. And the way it works is there is a fan which creates sort of a current which blows air up through the top past a uh, a, um, there's a lure uh, up on top, a human scent lure, that um, creates a um, plume of, of odor that then the mosquitoes are attracted to, and then they get sucked in uh, to the uh, fan in the center of the trap and into a collection net below. So all the mosquitoes are brought back to our lab in uh, New Haven. And the species are, trap collections are, are sorted. And we pick out all the female mosquitoes and all those are identified to the species level. So those are, uh, identifications are completed on the day of collections. Uh, and each of the species are then sorted into tubes based on species, site, and trap type. Now we can't test every individual mosquito. We collect way too many in any given day. So what we do is we pool the mosquitoes. We group them into pools by species and site and um, into these tubes uh, over to the side. And uh, all of the mosquitoes that are collected are tested for viral infection. So then the next day, the mosquitoes are brought to our biosafety level three lab to test for viral infection. So in order to determine if they're carrying a virus, uh, we first screen them in cell culture. This allows us to tell, tells us if they have any uh, uh, cytopathic virus. So we grind up the mosquitoes in uh, uh, saline solution and then inoculate that uh, sample into varicell cultures and monitor the cells for evidence of virus growth. So the viruses themselves are too small to see by microscopy, but we can examine their effects on cell cultures and, and we look for cytopathic effect in the cells. And then we know there's a virus in there. And then once we know there's a virus, we can then identify it by a variety of molecular techniques. Uh, PCR is the primary um, uh, technique that we use uh, for uh, virus identification. So the, really the advantage of using cell culture is it allows us to screen for a whole diversity of viruses that are out there, not just the viruses that we're looking for. So over the years, we've detected a number of uh, mosquito-borne viruses or viruses carried by mosquitoes, including not just West Nile virus and triple E virus, which I talked about earlier, but a number of other um, viruses you probably never heard about, um, like Jamestown Canyon virus, Cache Valley virus, Lacrosse virus, Tributatus virus. These are viruses that can cause human disease, um, uh, maybe more rarely or uh, than Tripoli or West Nile virus, but still are human pathogens. And um, so it allows us to um, look for um, some of these other agents as well. It also puts us in a position to detect any exotic virus. If a new virus like Zika virus or chikungunya virus was introduced into our area, we would be in a position to detect it using our cell culture uh, technique. 
So a little bit about Tripoli virus. Tripoli virus, uh, last year we had a major outbreak. We had a number of human cases and fatalities in the state. And so I'll spend a little time talking about that. Uh, it is a, a mosquito-borne virus maintained in this bird mosquito transmission cycle. So uh, there's one mosquito species in particular called Culicida melanura, which is a bird biting mosquito found in freshwater swamps in the state. And it feeds almost exclusively on birds, and it will carry the virus, infect a bird, and birds are the only vertebrate hosts that develop a high enough virus uh, uh, levels in the bloodstream that they can then uh, infect new mosquitoes, thus completing the transmission cycle. So virus amplification occurs from July through October in this bird mosquito transmission cycle, but at some point as a virus builds, it can uh, spill over into human and horse populations. and, and uh, this occurred last year. We had a number of human and uh, horse cases. And the species, uh, mosquitoes that are involved in transmission uh, to horses and humans include Culicida melanura, which will occasionally feed on, on mammals. But there are a couple other species that have been implicated as, as bridge vectors, bringing the virus. These are species like Cochleotidia perturbans and certain native species that feed opportunistically on both birds and on humans, can then pick up the virus from a bird and transmit it to a human. Humans and horses are not involved in the transmission cycle, so we call these incidental infections. They're not contributing to uh, virus amplification um, in that cycle. So this just shows where the virus has been detected over the years. So you'll see the mosquito trapping sites uh, the locations where we detected virus in mosquitoes are indicated in black, and the size of the circle is uh, scaled depending on uh, the number of years that virus has been detected in those locations. And you'll see that the focal area for Tripoli virus is in the eastern half of the state. This is also where all the human and equine cases have occurred over the years um, in that area. Uh, and really, these are more tend to be in more rural areas. Uh, the focal areas for Tripoli are in locations in freshwater swamps and in forested areas surrounding woodlands uh, where the major mosquito uh, uh, carrier lives. You'll see uh, in the right-hand uh, lower corner the number of virus isolations per year from mosquitoes. And you'll see that there's quite a bit of variation from year to year. About every five years, we see these spikes in Tripoli virus activity. And uh, 2019 was no different. We had a very uh, intense uh, year for virus transmission. Um, and uh, so Tripoli virus is very unpredictable and sporadic. It doesn't necessarily occur every year. Um, but when the conditions are right, it can really take off and, and create um, uh, an outbreak like we saw last year. This just shows the epidemic curve for uh, Tripoli virus last year. Um, so we had uh, four human cases last year and uh, a total of six uh, horse cases. Um, it also shows the, the lines show virus detection in mosquito species. So the red are mosquito species that are non-mammalian biters, like Culicida melanura, that feed mainly on birds. The blue are the mosquito species that feed on uh, mammals. And you'll see there's a sharp rise in virus uh, detections in mosquitoes in late August. Uh, followed uh, by a number of human cases extending well into mid-September. Um, and really the virus continued on well into October. So virus transmission will continue into the first hard frost when uh, mosquito activity uh, finally um, uh, subsides. So uh, uh, these mosquitoes will continue uh, well into uh, transmitting the virus well into October as we saw last year. A little bit about West Nile virus. So West Nile virus is the other virus of concern. We see that every 
summer. We have human cases uh, every year. Uh, it is the dominant uh, mosquito-borne disease in our region. And it is also maintained in a bird mosquito transmission cycle, but it involves very different mosquito species. Uh, the Culex pipiens is the primary mosquito carrier of the virus. Uh, and this species is found in more urban and suburban parts of the state. Uh, so the virus is amplified June through October in this bird mosquito transmission cycle. Uh, and uh, it will spill over into humans and horses. Uh, typically, that human cases occur a little later in the season. Um, and the time of peak risk is really August and September. Um, number of other species uh, are involved in transmission to humans. Culex pipiens will feed on mammals as well as birds, uh, uh, serving as an epidemic bridge, transmitting the virus to humans. Uh, there's another couple other species, Culex salinarius and Aedes vexans, that also are implicated in epidemic transmission to uh, people. This just shows where we detect the virus from mosquitoes uh, over the years. And uh, West Nile virus is pretty much the mirror image of Triple E virus. So I showed that map of Triple E virus activity. And with most of the, the activity occurring in rural parts of the state, in the eastern half of the state, West Nile virus occurs more in the western part of the state, primarily in this urban corridor between New Haven and uh, well down to Greenwich and uh, up in the Hartford area are the focal areas for uh, West Nile virus detection in mosquitoes uh, as well as in people. So we tend to see virus uh, um, human cases uh, closely parallel where we detect the virus in mosquitoes in that um, I, urban corridor uh, in uh, Lower Fairfield, Lower New Haven County, and up in the Hartford County area. This just shows an epidemic curve uh, for West Nile virus buildup in both uh, the mosquitoes, which is the white line, and then this is when we detect uh, virus in humans here in Connecticut. And you'll see that uh, West Nile virus detections in mosquitoes uh, peak earlier than uh, the peak of human cases. So this uh, shows just how um, using mosquito data gives us a little bit of an advanced warning of uh, West Nile virus risk uh, to people. There are also, I should say, this is based on the date of uh, disease onset, uh, the red lines. And usually there are further delays in reporting and diagnosis of human cases. So we really um, rely on the mosquito data to guide all of our uh, public health interventions. And really the peak risk of uh, West Nile virus detection, uh, or, or at least of human cases, really occurs in August and late August and into early September. So with that, I would like to thank uh, all of my uh, colleagues at the Experiment Station, um, particularly the uh, full-time staff, John Shepard, Tanya Petrov, who run mosquito collection and identification efforts, Angela Bransfield, and Mike Masinchik, who are primarily responsible for uh, virus uh, isolation and identification in uh, Biosafety Level 3 lab and all the seasonal staff that um, do the hard work um, that make all of this possible. So uh, each summer uh, we hire a number of uh, recent graduates or um, college students and train them to uh, identify and uh, test all the mosquitoes and set the traps uh, to make this possible. I'd also like to thank all of our partners, uh, particularly those in the Department of Public Health, who we work very closely with, and Department of Energy and Environmental Protection. Also colleagues from the uh, Department of Agriculture, and uh, also uh, folks from the U.S. Navy Groton Base, who um, run one of our traps uh, out there. So if you have any questions, here's my contact information. I'd also encourage you 
to look at our website if you want to get update to date information on the mosquito surveillance data and uh, learn about some of the um, sort of uh, measures that you can do around the home to protect your family and um, to uh, reduce your exposure to mosquitoes. So these two websites for the Mosquito Management Program and the Mosquito Surveillance Program um, are given below. And thank you very much for your attention.